Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is good to see everyone Amen. back in the, our Lord's house on Lord's Day. It was good to be here today. So, especially this time of year, we're celebrating the birth of our Lord and Savior. Let's go. Uh, let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for today, Lord. We do thank you for uh, being here today, Lord. Lord, we do thank you this time of year. Lord, we pray, Lord, we keep in our hearts and our minds, Lord, what this is all about, about the, the birth of our Lord and Savior, Lord, as we go through this time. Lord, uh, what a great time to tell someone about you. And, uh, Lord, we, we do thank you once again for, for the time coming back together here, Lord. We do pray as we come today, Lord, that all the things we do today, we, we look focused on you, Lord. We keep our eyes on you, Lord, and we do it uh, in your will. And Lord, we do it for you, Lord. And as we sing these songs, these, uh, these songs of... Uh, Christmas songs, these songs of uh, your birth, Lord, that once again we just sing out. Lord, you've given the, the preacher a, uh, a message today to give to us, Lord. It'll be us. We pray, Lord, we're attentive. We open our hearts and minds to that. And Lord, all the things we do today, Lord, we just pray we do to honor and glorify you. Yes. And we do this. We ask all these things in our Lord Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's all stand, please. And we want to turn to song number 44. 44. Joy to the world. Amen. 44. This is one I think we know. Joy to the world. Joy to the world.
Friends, we want to, of course, continue to pray for our nation. Um, Wednesday night, we'll, we'll continue in our study in the book of Revelation um, downstairs. So, 7 o'clock, I've got the lessons for you. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting study. We're going to be looking into the church at Pergamos. And so, I've got some lessons for you to add to your book. Uh, your notebook. So <clears throat> this this Wednesday night, seven o'clock, we continue in our study of the Book of Revelation. There's a couple of happy birthdays, birthdays that have already passed. But Megan had a birthday, and Willow just had a birthday. She's a young teenager of 95. So we pray for Willow and uh, Bob and Sharon are having an anniversary coming up on December the 18th. So we're praying for you, brother. And uh, it's good to have Brother Mark and Susan with us. And always good to have you. Brother Mark is going to come and he's going to present us a uh, Gideon's presentation. And uh, we're grateful for the Gideon's um, distribution of Bibles. Um, and um, we, we thank the Lord for you, Brother. COVID-19 has changed everybody's world, not to mention Gideon's International. A lot of things we weren't able to do because of COVID-19, we stopped our jail ministry, we had one up in Hillsdale and we can't get in the jail, so that uh, was a place where we'd have service and then one-on-one -on -one visitations where they'd be able to hand out the word of God there. So that was shut down. <coughs> Different ways of uh, travel, especially internationally, that was shut down. So our Gideon representatives couldn't make it to the various countries to help with distributions in those countries. So that didn't occur. But there have been different ways uh, that it has been occurring where people are sharing the gospel. <coughs> it's uh, Interesting to me, I've been watching some of this because of COVID-19 on YouTube, so I get to watch some of the Calvary Baptists on YouTube. So I've been watching your Bible Institute, and you are studying, or have been studying, personal evangelism. And that was a, a topic of a, a Gideon in Colombia, was evangelism training. What he found out was, he said, the Lord gave him a passion for reaching more people for Jesus after learning and experiencing that believers sit in churches more often than being the church. So that sounds like there's no personal evangelism going on there. So they, as Gideons in that church, as members of that church, were helping to teach people how to evangelize. It's been pretty easy for me uh, to be able to hand out a free New Testament and start the conversation. Sure. <coughs> Personal evangelism by just handing out a free gift. Mm -hmm. Then you can walk right into Jesus Christ. But one of the things he said with the training was the Holy Spirit has to direct our witnesses. Amen. If the Holy Spirit's not involved yeah. and soften the heart of the listener, then it's all for naught. Mm. I'd like to read a little scripture, Matthew uh, 20. 8th verse, chapter, verse 19, very familiar. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all the way, even unto the end of the world. So Jesus is with us as we're proclaiming his gospel message. I uh, thought it was interesting, Brother Dwayne, in his prayer this morning when he opened up, said, the Christmas season upon us, the birth of our Savior. Boy, there's an open door for conversation. You can present the gospel with that conversation. It's Christmas time. Merry Christmas. Do you know Jesus? Amen. Eliminate all the fluff right. and all the things that aren't Christmas That's right. and present the gospel message. Amen. There was a uh, lady... Her name is Deborah. At the age of 14, she received a little New Testament like this. She said from the Gideons, while she was at school in Trinidad, and she started to read it, but didn't believe much of it because she was Hindu. She 
She said her parents brought her up to believe in the god of wind, which is named Bayu. The stories about God in the Testament were interesting. They were interesting enough to read, but that's all they were to her. They were just stories. She kept reading it throughout the years, and at age 17, she looked in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, where Jesus commanded the wind to stop. Amen. Now, her God was the God of wind. And she read that Jesus said, Peace, be still. Amen. And then stop. And do you know her response to that? In that moment, I didn't hesitate. I gave my life to Jesus. A young lady named Nat Natalia was 15 years old. She was already addicted to drugs. And her life was uh, going nowhere real quick. Everything soon came to a head when she <coughs> grew gravely ill. Her body couldn't support the lifestyle she had been maintaining for so long, which was full of chaos, sin, and despair. <coughs> Natalia stayed in the hospital for over a year, but her health only worsened. She couldn't walk or even stand. Natalia was hopeless, and she saw no purpose for her life. One day, though, she saw a glimpse of something more. Gideons and their wives actually visited the hospital and presented her with a little New Testament. And they prayed for her. And she said no one had prayed for her before, especially not strangers. But she began to read the New Testament that they gave her and then search out fellowship with other, other believers. And she said all the while, God was at work began to heal Natalia's broken body and spirit. And she said it was the Lord who gave her hope when she had none. After Natalia joined a local church, she became totally healthy. Now she's married with children. She and her husband, Dimitri, are members of the Gideons. And Natalia returns often to the hospital where she stayed and witnesses now to the ill and the broken hearted. A Gideon from Mississippi was in a distribution in India, and while he was there, he actually heard a uh, native's testimony. The native's name is Subaro, and Subaro says during his testimony, I didn't grow up as a Christian. Not only was I not a Christian, but I was strongly against the Christian religion. <coughs> Picture someone very outspoken with their negative opinions, and that was me. I had to keep fueling my distaste, though. And to do so, I needed to learn as much about the religion as I could to dispute it. When I was 18, he said, I stopped by a local Christian church. I was respectful, and I asked to borrow a copy of their holy book. He said the thing was rather large and, cl and clunky. So he said the man helping me thought of something better. He said this isn't the full Bible, but it's still got Jesus in it. So he handed him a Gideon New Testament. And Sabaro says he hurried home and he started reading. And he started reading the four Gospels. And the truth of God's word practically knocked the wind out of him, he says. I was face to face with real, true, everlasting love. He says, I didn't hesitate. I accepted Christ as my Lord and my Savior. He says, that was almost 30 years ago. And now he's a church planner and overseer with the Indian Baptist Society. He says, when I reflect on this journey of faith, it's incredible to see how God has brought me to a life of joy in Him. And I'm just going to extrapolate a little bit your personal evangelism as that's being taught. I think that extends not only personally, obviously it's personal, one-to-one, -one, but I think you do that with your missions, and your congregation is great mission supporters. Uh, we can't go into all the world, as it said in the scripture, but Others are sent. And you're personally evangelizing the world Amen. as you support those missionaries. Amen. And I see we, obviously, as Gideons International, are one of your mission yes. points. Mm -hmm. And so your personal evangelism with your prayers and your financial support is helping to hand out the Word of God. Amen. The Word of God not, might not be received by someone as soon as you hand them this little book. Nor might it be received in a hotel where it's sitting in a drawer waiting on somebody. But God knows who that Bible's there for. Oh, yeah. And he knows when they're going to walk in and read it. Sure. 
and you have helped personally evangelize the lost Amen. in that way. So don't think of personal evangelism as just me and what can I do. It is, and that's a big part of it. But you're doing so much more than that as you support missions mm -hmm. and as you support Gideon's International. We do thank you for your support. Ask for your continued prayers mm -hmm. so that we can get back out there and hand out the Bibles freely. Yeah. And we do ask God's blessing upon each of you. We do appreciate our time mm -hmm. as we get to join and worship with you folks. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, hey, let's all uh, let's all stand, please. Again, we want to turn to song number sixty-seven. Sixty-seven, the old rugged cross. Let's stand, please. <coughs>
Um, obviously, last few years we had the kids sing. Um, we won't be doing that this year, but um, I still like to do our candlelight service for next Sunday. And uh, we'll sing some wonderful Christmas songs and uh, have a brief message. Now, you don't believe that, right? No. <laughs> no. But there will be a message. And then uh, we'll turn the lights out and we'll sing Silent Night to Candlelight. Sound good? Yeah. All right. And then we'll blow those candles out. And Lord willing, we'll reuse them again next year and the year following. They started out about this tall. Now they're down to about this. So we probably have about 10 or 15 years yet to go. Okay, so anyway, it'll be good. It'll be good. All right, I'd like for you to take the word of God today and turn with me in two places. First, Genesis chapter number 22. Genesis chapter number 22. And then Luke chapter number 2. Genesis 22 and Luke chapter number 2. Uh, the title of today's message is Behold the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. It is a Christmas message. It is a Christmas message. It is a message about our, our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lamb of God. God's true Lamb. God's truly Lamb. A true Lamb. And uh, <clears throat> so this week and next week, I want to be speaking about this very subject. Behold the Lamb of God. In Genesis chapter 22, <clears throat> we have just an incredible uh, account here of Abraham and Isaac and on Mount Moriah and Abraham is... <clears throat> going to offer his son, his only son, as a sacrifice here. <laughs> and there's just so many striking similarities in Genesis chapter 22 between Isaac and the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So we'll begin reading here in verse number 1. <clears throat> Genesis 22 verse 1 says, and it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. Just notice some of the striking similarities in verse number two here between Isaac and the Lord Jesus. First of all, he refers to him as thy son in verse number two, thy son. I think about Isaiah chapter nine in verse number six, the Bible says, unto us a son is given, thy son, God's son. Then also in verse number two, he refers to him as thine only son, thine only son, Isaac. Of course, John chapter three tells us about the great love of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God's only begotten son. And then notice also, whom thou lovest, whom thou lovest. This is my beloved son, the father said, of his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So in verse number two, some striking similarities. Now look at verse number three. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. 
What great confidence Abraham here had here in the, pro in the promises of God. Then in verses 6 through 9, And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And they took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? What a question. What a question. Where is the lamb? Where is the lamb? <laughs> Notice verse number 8. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb. God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. Verse number 13, we see the provision of God. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him, a ram caught in a thicket by his thorns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. That is an amazing verse, verse number eight. The very promise of God, what God would do for a sacrifice here. There was only one sacrifice that was sufficient. There's only one sacrifice that could ever take away sins. There was only one sacrifice who was slain from the foundation of the world who could ever provide atonement for mankind. And that's God's only begotten Son. Amen. Behold the Lamb, amen. Behold the Lamb. It's an amazing, an amazing account of God provided himself a lamb. Himself God provided. Himself God provided. When we think of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, we cannot even begin to fully comprehend who he really is and what he is really all about. There is none other, there is no person, no person like the Lord Jesus Christ. We consider him from eternity past. We consider the fact he is the ancient of days. We consider the fact that Micah said, Thou hast come forth from everlasting, even unto everlasting. We consider the fact that he is the uncreated one, the one who came into this world and took upon human flesh and condescended and, and became man without ever ceasing to be God. Without ever ceasing to be God. We think about the one who lived a, a perfectly sinless life. His impeccable, his impeccable nature. The perfect God-man. You can't distinguish between where the deity of Christ begins and his humanity begins. No, no. He is the God-man. The God-man. My, my, my. And when we think about chapter number 22 here, God provided himself a lamb. Himself God provided. He provided. You know, we see this expression of the Lord Jesus as the Lamb of God throughout the New Testament. In John chapter 1, verse number 20, 29, the Bible says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He taketh away the the sin of the world. Our Lord Jesus Christ was our vicarious substitute on the cross of Calvary. He who knew no sin was made sin for us. He took away the sin of the world. When you come to Christ and receive the free gift of salvation, you understand that he has purged our sins. It means he has taken them, he has taken them all the way. John chapter 1, verse number 36 says, And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. John, in Revelation, 
chapter number 13 and in uh, verse number 8 pens these words and he, and he says this <clears throat> and it, it says here and, uh, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of the life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Behold the Lamb of God. The Lord Jesus Christ is God's only way of salvation. There is no other way. When we come to Christmas and we recognize the birth of Jesus Christ, we need to take into consideration his incarnation. He became man without ever ceasing to be God. We need to consider his crucifixion, the lamb slain, the lamb slain. And we also need to consider his resurrection because the Lord Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. The lamb slain is the lamb alive. Amen. We need to consider his bodily ascension into heaven where he is right now. Seated at the Father's right hand, making intercession for them that believe. Oh, what a Savior. Amen. What a Savior. Behold the Lamb of God. I'd like for you to turn now to Luke chapter number 2. We often refer to this as the Christmas story, but this is an actual account. It's an actual account. And in these verses in chapter number 2, our text tells us about the night when the Father's promise was fulfilled. It was the moment when God's promise to send his Redeemer into the world was fulfilled. See, God keeps his word, amen? God fulfills his word. So as we look at the Lamb of God, I want us to notice three aspects of the Lamb's provision for us today. Now, in chapter number two here, Let's note, first of all, in verses 1 through 7, the place involved in the Lamb's provision, this particular place. Now, I'll read verses 1 through 3. It says, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. Now we're going to see the place involved in the Lamb's provision. And note with me in verse number four, the planning, the planning of this place. It says, And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea unto the city of David which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David. See the planning of this place, the planning of this place here. This was no, this was no accident with God. There was a very specific place that God had determined where the Lord Jesus would be born. Micah tells us that he would be born in Bethlehem of Judea. In other words, fulfilling the very word of God. You see, God, God works in timing that is absolutely perfect. God's timing is always perfect. God is never too late, and he is never too early. <laughs> Sometimes we, we think that, that he is. Sometimes we're just, where is God in this time? But his planning and his timing is always perfect. It's impossible for God not to act in timing that is perfect. Everything about God and his, his character is perfect. 
And the way that God acts, listen, the way that God acts in human affairs in sending his son, the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, was an absolutely perfect timing. This is the place involved in the lamb's provision. I think also of the providence that's involved here. We read about the taxing. We read about the taxing here. Hey, you know there's no new thing under the sun, right? They were being taxed. And <clears throat> Caesar at the time and Herod at the time was in charge and they were the earthly people in charge. But listen, God was overruling. God was overruling. You know that God rules in the affairs of men? God rules in the affairs of mankind. He always has. We speak of history. I like to speak of history as his story. <clears throat> you look how God has ruled in the affairs of mankind. You go back and you read the book of Daniel, for example. And there were four kingdoms. Remember that image that Daniel had of those kingdoms? The head of gold and the silver and the brass and the legs of iron. And the thing was top heavy, wasn't it? It was top heavy. And Daniel looks and Daniel sees a stone uh, coming down out of heaven. And it lands upon that image and it dashes it to pieces. You know, that image that Daniel had was representing the four great Gentile world powers. But yet Almighty God in his sovereignty, in his providence, puts an end to it. And that, and that stone which came down and, and, and smashed that image to pieces became a great mountain overspreading the entire earth. Friend, that's, that's the Lord Jesus at his second coming. And his second coming to establish his kingdom here on earth. See, he was the lamb. He was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. But bless God, he is the coming king of kings and lord of lords. So the providence of that place. Look with me in verses 6 and 7. And notice something about the poverty. The poverty of that place. It says in verse 6 and 7, And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Every time I think about that, you know, there's so much that can be said. Do you have room for Jesus, right? There was no room, there was no room for the very son of God on the night that he was born. Can you imagine such a thing? The very creator, the divine creator of all things, there is no room for him on the night of his birth. You see, <clears throat> the Savior's entrance into this world, although, although the, the, the angels would worship and, and the shepherds would worship, was really anything but glorious. When we consider his entrance into this world, when Joseph and Mary arrived in Bethlehem, they discovered that there was no place for them to stay. They found refuge in a stall used to house animals. I don't think we can comprehend the enormity of the truth that's contained here. Imagine God himself, God himself came into this world, the one who made the universe, but came as a baby. The one who spoke everything into existence, yet came as the most harmless being that there is. The Lord Jesus was not born in the lap of luxury. He was not born that way at all. He was born in the squalor of abject poverty. He humbled himself, is what he did. When he entered into this world, he came in the form of a servant, the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. In Philippians, and I'll just read this to you real quick, in Philippians chapter number 2 and in verses 5 
through 8, we read this, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. That's because he was. But made himself of no reputation. <clears throat> And took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And one Bible preacher friend of mine said that every time he reads this passage, became obedient unto death, he reads it like that, this even the death of the cross. Even the death of the cross. The most horrible form that man ever devised for the execution of someone was to be crucified on a cross. And yet he's the Lamb of God, amen? The Lamb of God sacrificed for our sins. You know, when Jesus died, just like during his earthly life, he lived a life of abject poverty. There were times in his life where he had nowhere to lay his head. He depended upon the goodness of others to minister unto him. And even when he died, even when the Lord Jesus died, others provided the place and the things that were necessary for his burial. You see, he was buried in a borrowed tomb. Joseph's new tomb. It's amazing, but the God who made everything and could have had anything, he chose to live a life of poverty. Why is that? Well, a couple of passages. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9 says, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. You know, that almost seems unfair. That almost seems unfair when you first read that. But that's what he did. He became poor. See, the Lord Jesus Christ, he, he's, he's a sympathetic high priest. Amen. He's not untouched with the feelings of our infirmities. That means he is touched. You know, he lived 33 years, his earthly life. And in that time, in that time, he experienced everything in life any of us will ever experience. Even beyond that, he's tasted death. He's tasted death for every man. He's tasted it. He's experienced death. He's experienced poverty. He's experienced rejection. The Lord Jesus on the cross, there was nobody, nobody there except for John and, and, and Mary. But they had all forsook him and fled. He had experienced rejection, physical pain, weariness, absolute hatred. There has never been a person that has been more hated in human history than Jesus Christ. And that is a fact. That is a fact. Why is it that he is so politically incorrect? Why is it that you can get into trouble for naming the name of Jesus? Why is it that they want to keep him out of every public domain and area? in life. He's experienced all of that. Yea, he's experienced joy. The joy of Jesus, amen. Yeah. He's experienced life. I think one of the greatest moments in all of human history was the raising of Lazarus from the dead. The Lord Jesus had purposely stayed away for four days his omniscient mind knowing that Lazarus was dead. If you can get the picture, there is so much to that scene 
where the Lord Jesus comes to the tomb and everybody is coming with him. They're all coming with Jesus to the tomb. Why? Because ultimately that's where human physical life ends for everybody. They're all coming with Jesus to the tomb and he comes to that tomb and he tells them to roll the stone away and he cries, Lazarus, come forth. And he that had been dead came forth, bound hand and foot, but man loosed the graves and let him go. And Lazarus came forth alive. Can you imagine, prior to that, the, the Lord's heart was broken because, because of the sorrow that death brings. But I'm telling you, the Lamb, He is the, he is the conqueror of death. Yeah. I'm telling you that, that He has conquered death through the cross of Calvary and through his resurrection. Folks, he is alive. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ is alive today. And he is the solution to every single problem that this world faces today. Yeah. Our prayer is that men would repent <laughs> and turn to Jesus Christ. Yeah. And that's why we, we, we get the gospel out. That's why the, the Gideons take the good news, amen? The good news, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for sinners. And that's why they, they bring it to, to a jail. That's why they send it to schools and, and to hotel rooms. You know why? Because God is not willing that any should perish. But that all might come unto repentance. That, my friend, is the great love of God. When you look at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no greater love than that. Amen. The lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Hebrews 4 verses 15 and 16 says, For we have an high priest, excuse me, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin, so verse number 16 says, let us therefore, amen, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Why? That we may obtain mercy. Praise God. We can obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. I want you to notice also some of the pictures that we see in verse number seven, the Bible tells us she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. Sometimes those strips of cloths of cloth was used to strengthen the arms and strengthen the legs and, and, and so forth. But it was also the means that was used to wrap a person who had just died. Uh, it's a picture of his death, folks. Even right then and there, even right then and there, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ came to die. Even as a babe, the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And it tells us, and laid him in a manger, a feeding trough. And where did it take place? In Bethlehem. You know the word Bethlehem, the name Bethlehem means the house of bread. How fitting it was for Jesus Christ to be born in such a place, the house of bread. John chapter 6, verse 35 says, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that believeth, he that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Jesus is the bread of life, born in Bethlehem, the house of bread. Let's note secondly in verse 15 through 19, we saw the place involved in the Lamb's provision, but notice the people involved in the Lamb's provision. The shepherds, the shepherds here. I'd like for you to note in verse number eight, their occupation. It says, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. When you think about these shepherds, 
you see some characteristics of being faithful here. These men were abiding in the field. These men understood what hard work was all about. These were men who, who stayed away from the worship at the temple for an extended period of time because, because they had a flock to take care of. They, they were faithful. They were faithful. These were not men. These were not men who would be considered the great and high men of society. These shepherds, actually shepherds, were an abomination to the Egyptians. The Egyptians hated the shepherds, but it was to these men, to the lowly, to the outcast, if you would, to those who were forsaken and forgotten by others, that, that, that the Lamb's provision came to first. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ, listen, the Lord Jesus Christ came for all. He came for all. Whether one be rich or whether one be poor or one, whether one be healthy or sick or what not, the Lord Jesus Christ came for all. When we think about the cross and we think about the, the sacrifice of the Lamb, it extends to every single person. Yeah. It extends to all. It's not limited. It's unlimited. It's the unlimited grace of Almighty God. God willing to send His Son for every single soul. That is why, that is why you can go to any person in the world, regardless of where they are, and you can tell that person and be 100% accurate and say, Jesus Christ died for your sin. Because he died for all. He died for all. We see their obedience in verses 15 and 16. Um, we see, and it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us know, now go even to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us, and they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. My, 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 what did they do? They went out and they began to proclaim this good news. They began, hey, listen, they began to fulfill their part of the Great Commission, amen? They began to proclaim it here. Verses 17 through 19, and when they had seen it, they made known abroad. They made it known. The saying which was told them concerning the child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. And Mary kept all these things and pondered them in their heart. They made it known. They made it known. God has provided himself a lamb. God gave us his son. They just didn't keep it to themselves. They spread forth that good news. That's the Great Commission, amen? Yeah. That's going, listen, I, I, the Great Commission is given to us, I like to say that five parts make the whole. Each time at the end of the Gospels, and then once in the beginning of the book of Acts, five parts make the whole. You know what the Lord Jesus said to the disciples in John chapter number 20? As the Father sent me, even so send I you. In other words, under divine commission. As God sent the Son into this world, Jesus said, even so send I you. <clears throat> We've been given a divine commission. We've been, we've been entrusted, and this is our stewardship church, we've been entrusted with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not just something that we hear on Christmas, but our life and our ministry. See, God, is, God has given to us the, the ministry of reconciliation. The word of reconciliation is, 
be reconciled to God. In other words, in other words, come to God, but you can only come God's way. You can only come through sacrifice. You can only come to God through Christ. But that is the way to come. And when you come to Christ by God's way, you come and you find forgiveness of sin. You come and you experience the pardon. You come and you receive his grace, his unmerited favor for salvation. That's when you come to God his way. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You know, Brother Mark was talking about it, but Christmas, Christmas of any time of the year is just an amazing opportunity to get the gospel out, to take the gospel to someone. Every one of us, I believe, knows someone who needs Jesus Christ. There's not one person that, that we know of, family, relative, friend, co-worker, wherever, that does not need Jesus. You know, I'm finding out something, and I mean, October was a great month, and I think October's ended now. Close. Close. All right, so. Uh, <clears throat> but it doesn't slow down as you get older. Time speeds up. <laughs> it gets a little quicker and quicker and quicker. And you know, God has given us, God has given the church one thing to do. That's to get the gospel out. That's what the Great Commission is. So we see the people involved. That's any of us, amen. And then we find some praise involved in the Lamb's provision. Very quickly, look with me in verses 9 through 14. On that night there was heavenly praise. It tells us here, And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. A Savior. A Savior. Jesus, Jehovah is salvation. Christ, the Messiah, the anointed of God. Why did the Lord Jesus Christ come? Well, Matthew tells us, in chapter number one, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, all capital letters, for he shall save his people from their sins. He himself shall save. He himself is the lamb that God provides. On that night of the Lamb's provision, there was great praise. And notice also in verse number 20, human praise. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. See, that's the praise that comes from a changed heart. A heart that's been changed by the grace of God. See, God has given us in salvation a new heart. God has changed us, amen? amen. And if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. 
Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. God's greatest gift, greatest gift was God sending his only begotten son into this world to bleed and die on the cross of Calvary, to bring us to God, the just for the unjust, to be our substitute, to pay the full price, the full price of sin. If we were to tally up sins, no man could stand. But through the precious blood of Christ, the Lamb slain, as we have accepted him by faith, <laughs> then our sin is as far as east is from west. Never to meet again. Never to meet again. And we stand in him complete. Complete. It is a perfect salvation accomplished by a perfect Savior which is eternal, forever, forever. And one day, and I believe soon, we're going to meet him. We're going to meet him. I thank God that in my life there was a time where I trusted the Lord Jesus and I can meet him on his terms, amen? But I would not want to be someone who doesn't know the Lord Jesus today in these times, knowing that life is but a vapor, one heartbeat away from eternity. And if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, you can come to him today. He's calling. He's calling. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. He's calling. And if you come to him by faith and received Christ as your Savior, promises to forgive you, promises to cleanse you, give you a, uh, make you a new creature in Christ, and a home in heaven to add to it. Let's bow for prayer. Our Father, we come to you, Lord, and we thank you, Father, that we can gather together this Lord's Day, and we thank you, Lord, for the fact that you are the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. Lord, you're the only way of salvation, the only way to go to heaven, the only way that sins can be forgiven. We thank you, Lord, that today is still the day of salvation, that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all might come unto repentance. Lord, I pray that there is one here today listening and watching and whatnot who's not sure about their relationship with you. God, I pray you'd stir in their hearts, Lord. Help them to see their need. Help them to call on the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray as a church, Father, that Christmas is a great time to spread forth the gospel message. God, help us to be obedient to your command. Help us to witness in these days that we're living in. We'll give you the praise and glory for it. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. Song number 352. Praise him, praise him. 352. Let's all stand, please.
praise you continuously. Mm -hmm. uh, Lord, we do thank you so much for, for what's been done, Lord. And Lord, the uh, message today was so, so true, Lord, that once again, at this time when we do praise you, we look forward to your birth, Lord, that uh, what was done on the cross uh, to save each and every one of us. Oh, yes. You certainly don't deserve that, Lord. How you finish that. Lord, we do thank you so much for that, Lord. And we pray, Lord, during this time of year, uh, put someone in our life that yes. we can tell about you. Amen. Lord, give us the boldness to, to, to tell them what you mean to us, Lord. Mm -hmm. Lord, we do pray, Lord, that that be the time that we would be able to tell someone, Lord. And uh, uh, we would thank you for that. Lord, uh, we thank you for each and every one here today. Lord, our prayer be that no one walks out those doors without knowing you personally, right. Lord. Lord, and uh, repenting of their sins. Well. Uh, what a time of the year that would be to, to uh, gloriously come to know you in a personal <coughs> sense that you, you want each and every one, you want no man to, right. to uh, no man not to know you, Lord. And Lord, my prayer be once again that uh, if we can somehow have something to do with that, Lord, mm. help us do that. Yeah. Even now, Lord. We yes. do thank you for the giving, Lord. We thank you for Brother Mark and, and uh, Sister Susan being here today, Lord, and their uh, faithfulness to that organization and how Gideons get the, the Bibles out to the people that typically wouldn't get them. Lord, mm. we do thank you. Continue to bless that organization and bless Mark and Susan as they do this, Lord, and we do thank you so much for them being here today. Yes. Lord, and once again, as we go through this Christmas time, this time celebrating your birth, Lord, uh, we pray, Lord, we just keep first and foremost what, what this time of year is about. Don't let some of these other things get in our way, but uh, uh, look towards you, Lord. Once again, we'll thank you so much for that. Lord, we do ask a uh, Lord, we do ask a blessing on this offering we're yes. about to give, Lord. We do thank you how you just continue to take Amen. care of this church. Amen. Um, you just bless this church time and time again, Lord. Yes. And as we uh, give today, Lord, that we uh, bless this offering. Mm -hmm. We be good stewards of this, Lord. We continue to take care of not just the things here in uh, in Delta and in, in this community, but also uh, continue to support our missionaries, not just financially, but prayerfully. Yes. Lord, we make a, a commitment during, during this time to, to pray for each and every one of the missionaries we have throughout the world. We thank you so much for putting these people uh, in our church, Lord, mm -hmm. that we're able to take care of them. Once again, Lord, thank you for today's message. Thank you for the good spirit here today. Thank you for bringing us back together. Amen. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You're dismissed.